welcome back to Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. Today it's episode 81 and I'm going to focus on soil chemistry, specifically how you can take two identical species, locate them in slightly different soil chemistries and end up with very different looking boards or perhaps different uh, technical performance characteristics and things like that. I get a lot of questions about people who are confused about I've got this board or say this uh, piece of walnut and this piece of walnut and they look dramatically different or I'm told that this is a piece of cherry but it doesn't look anything like it and I don't think it actually is. Further investigation you realize it actually is cherry but it just it grew in a different spot and it's one of those things that I think is kind of fascinating about just trees, I mean plants in general, anything that grows in the ground and how you can get regional or even hyper local variations based upon stuff like soil chemistry or possibly even external factors like weather or natural disasters that act upon the soil chemistry or the living tree or plant to create a different lumber product. Anyway. That's the main focus of the show today. Um, I do want to say thank you to all the patrons who continue to support the show. It's always a great help. You can sponsor the show over at patreon.com slash lumber update. Greatly, greatly appreciated. And more importantly, I want to thank everybody who continues to send in questions. The inbox is certainly filling up. I always can use more questions. I love them because it's fun to kind of go through and pick and choose to form shows like this that have a theme centered around those questions. So go to lumberupdate.com. There's a contact form you can fill out there to send a question or just send an email to lumberupdate at gmail.com. And there's a lot of folks who look me up on Instagram at lumberupdate as well and send me direct messages that way. So again, keep sending in those questions. And as always, thanks to those who sponsor the show. A little bit of industry news that I found interesting this week. The world's largest 3D printer. It's located at the University of Maine up in Orono, Maine. And right now they're using it to print houses in wood. It's that big. <laughs> they're, they're essentially making modular homes, but they're, they're printing them using wood flour. Um, very, very cool. This is kind of the, the next, I guess, stage in 3D printing when you can start to print something quite so large that it either is a structure itself or possibly could be the components like a wall for a house. Um, you think about what that would do to the construction industry, but more importantly, how it seems that printing wood, I've talked about this in the show before as being new and cutting edge. It seems like the idea of printing wood is actually becoming somewhat commonplace. Using wood flour to print in wood is now old hat enough that they're scaling it up to print whole houses. Future is now, folks, very, very cool. I'll include a link to that, that article as well because there's a couple pictures of this printer that's worth checking out. I was recently in Maine and um, I wasn't able to get up to Orono and I doubt they would have let me in to look at it anyway, but I was sorely tempted just to drive up there and see if somebody would let me in and look at it. Just since really, really cool. Uh, also, thanks to the hundreds of people who sent me emails letting me know that uh, uh, season two of Big Timber is now out on Netflix. Um, because Netflix also sent me an email since I watched the first season saying Big Timber 2 is there. I've only watched the first uh, episode so far. Seems par for the course. They're up to crazy stuff. Um, although the first episode was interesting because they started salvaging logs off of the beaches. And I, I was not aware of this. Um, you still have to actually pay for those logs. I guess they're still considered property of the Canadian government, but they're, uh, they're really, really cheap because you're reclaiming them and you're essentially reusing something. So there's a, you know, a vested interest to go and get your logs from off the beach, but typical, you know, they cobble together a bunch of crazy machinery and do some crazy stuff that looks like it's really, really dangerous. seems to be the theme of that show, but you know, it's good watching anyway. So thanks to everybody who reminded me of that. If you're unaware and you haven't seen season one of Big Timber, it's a fun watch, you know? It's a good thing to put on while you're working in the shop and now there's two seasons to uh, binge watch. This next one I thought was interesting. I don't remember where, how this landed uh, in my inbox or wherever it is, but there is a company who is reclaiming chopsticks. So Chinese, Asian restaurants all across the globe have chopsticks. They, they buy chopsticks. In fact, the, um, the lightweight uh, plywood product that I've talked about before that my company uses is called Feathercore. Um, it's actually used, um, the inner plies are made of falcata, uh, the species falcata, which is often used 
in making chopsticks. Now there's also a lot of bamboo being made into chopsticks. And this particular company called is called Chop Value. Um, they're really focusing on those bamboo chopsticks, but they're taking them and, and have actually set up like disposable or recyclable bins in various restaurants where they take those chopsticks, drop them in there, and occasionally this company comes and picks them up and using essentially epoxy or um, I'm not sure whether it's epoxy, a glue of some sort and a press, they're pressing them into blocks that can then be machined as lumber and they're making products and making tables and chairs and cutting boards and things out of reclaim chopsticks. So just kind of a fun little thing to look at. Some of the images on this site are really fascinating. And I believe this is actually like a franchise opportunity company. So you could actually start making chopstick, re reclaim chopstick furniture in your local network by you um, signing on to a franchise of this. Interesting stuff. Uh, I'm not sure I could say the future is now there where your furniture always smell like sweet and sour pork. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> that looks kind of cool. Um, also, some feedback. Um, in a recent episode, I talked about that um, database of all the trees in the city of Vancouver, and I threw it out and said, if anybody knows of other cities doing this, let me know. Well, I've heard from a whole score of you folks. There are tree databases in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, basically all across Canada, uh, just about every province. I've had somebody write in and say, there's one you know, in Toronto, and there's one in Quebec City. Um, New Brunswick, uh, not that's a province, um, Moncton, New, Br New Brunswick has one as well. Multiple places across British Columbia doing this. Also, um, Germany, the Netherlands. In fact, the Netherlands has an incredibly extensive database of trees. Um, although maybe one could say there's not that many trees in the Netherlands to begin with. So maybe the database isn't that big. Um, I heard of couple other uh, cities in the U.S. and for some reason I didn't write them down. I know Knoxville was one of them. Um, I think Portland, Oregon was another. Seattle was one. Um, somebody on the East Coast and now I'm forgetting who it was. But regardless, I've heard from a lot of you folks. I also heard um, a couple links to kind of uh, conglomerate uh, data sites that had other uh, not complete listings of trees but cities that maybe had started logging. Um, uh, 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 I, I I got me uh, got a, a comment on Twitter last week about the the quote of the week was um, Vancouver is logging all their trees in a database and it sounds like they're cutting them all down anyway they're conserving trees by logging them anyway uh, how how else can I put that they are they're logging them logging them in a database they're chronicling them documenting them in a database so it seems like there are other tr other companies companies, geez, countries across the United States that have started on this journey of trying to get all of their trees represented in a database. They're not there yet, but still, it's very cool to see that. I'm really curious to see kind of where this goes. Um, if there are any city planners out there who know anything about this or behind this, I'd love to know the mission. What is the reason for doing this? Are you recognizing trees as, as an asset for, for the, the particular city? Is this a potential move into urban lumber or is it more of just understanding where the trees are in relation to power lines and things like that? Or is it just somebody who said, hey, you've got a free moment. Go, <laughs> go capture all the trees in a database. I would love to know what the end game is and why uh, various cities are doing this. Um, I got an email from Margaret. Those of you who listen to Wood Talk know Margaret. She's in charge of the social media over there. And uh, she wants some Latin advice. And I thought this was kind of appropriate because I throw out Latin botanical names all the time on this show. And she says, what are the rules for capitalizing wood species names? I know it doesn't matter, but I'm interested anyway. And as typical with the Latin um, naming conventions, both whether it's flora or fauna, it's kind of like things have always been done this way, but it's hard to say why they've been done this way. Moreover, there's often a lot of confusion over the actual pronunciation because it's not strictly Latin in many cases. Um, it's kind of Latinese. <laughs> Sometimes there's, there's Latin bases, but other times it's like a guy's name. You know, Fraxinus Bob. <laughs> it's, it's a species of ash that Bob found, Fraxinus Bob. There's several instances where it will be named after regions like Caia senegalensis. It's an African mahogany that grows in Senegal. Caia ivorensis, the Ivory Coast Caia. Um, ivorensis is not a Latin word, but it's kind of like, sounds kind of Latin y. So it's very difficult to apply like rules of grammar to this, and it just kind of gets thrown out there. So the generally conceived 
um, idea is the genus is always capitalized and the species is in lowercase. So Kaya ivorensis would be with a capital K for Kaya and lowercase i for ivorensis. Quercus alba, white oak, it's the same way. Capital Q, lowercase a. Just one of those little things. If you happen to be in a situation where you're writing out the botanical name of a tree, the genus is capitalized, the species is uncapitalized. Thanks, Margaret. That's the type of, uh, type of trivia that people can get from this show to bore their friends and family to death at uh, cocktail parties and Thanksgiving and things like that. So uh, keep it alive there. So we're gonna talk about soil chemistry and this was um, spawned by a conversation from Mark who asked me about Manitoulin Island, Manitou, geez, I can't speak today, Manitoulin Island white cedar. And perhaps I'm mispronouncing that, but Manitoulin Island is uh, the largest freshwater island in the world. It's up on the north end of Lake Huron. Um, and uh, Mike is a Canadian. Um, he actually bought a cottage in Georgia Bay on Lake Huron. Um, and uh, this was uh, about a decade ago. He was told when he bought it that the original owners built all of the decks, um, docks, and stairs about 25 years ago. And um, he was going to, uh, they were using uh, Manitoulin white cedar to, to build those decks. So when it was time to replace two of the old docks, he wanted to reclaim that lumber. So he milled up the lumber and he was just shocked at just how beautiful the stuff was. Um, he dug into it more and that's when he found out that it wasn't just Eastern white cedar, it was Manitoulin Island white cedar is what he was told by the contractor who built the decks. And the contractor exclaimed, quote, you're in luck because that stuff lasts forever. So Mike basically says, you know, I'm familiar with Manitoulin Island, but I've never heard of Manitoulin Island white cedar. And so that brings up three questions. Is it a real species of cedar or just a marketing label? Does the cedar from Manitoulin Island have any particular characteristics that make it any more durable than Eastern white? And um, one in about every five boards on my deck is a reddish brown versus very blonde. Is there any reason for such a variety in the colors? And this is really, it got me thinking about um, all of the soil chemistry issues that can crop up um, with the same species with a wide geographic distribution. So let's address the first question. Manitoulin white cedar is not a specific species of cedar. It is Eastern white cedar or sometimes known as Northern white cedar. Thuya occidentalis is the botanical name for that. It is in the Thuya genus, just like Western red cedar, uh, but it's a different species. Occidentalis um, makes it Eastern white cedar or Northern white cedar. Manitoulin Island white cedar therefore really is branding, it's marketing. To some respect, I mean, it's not a different species, but it does denote the regionality of it. And why I think it's particularly important and why I think Manitoulin white cedar has gotten a name to the point where you think it's its own species is there does appear to be some difference. Um, so if you were to look at it under a microscope, you'll find the pore structure, the, uh, all of that that identifies white cedar as white cedar will be the same. And that's why it's the same species. But the grade of that cedar, the growth rings, the amount of resin and extractives in there, and therefore the resistance to rot and wind and, and water and weather and all that does appear to be better than mainland white cedar. And I did a little bit of digging into this. And really what this comes down to is um, Manitoulin Island sits on an outcropping of dolomite. Uh, with a huge amount of limestone. Dolomite and limestone are both sedimentary rocks. And the mainland um, up on, you know, on the coast of Lake Huron is granite-based, um, um, igneous rock, uh, metamorphic rock, excuse me. Jeez, my uh, mineralogist of the year award, just I just lost it by saying it was a metamorphic or uh, igneous. Um, granite is obviously very, very different from sedimentary rock and from a mineral composition, very, very different. Sedimentary rocks tend to be better for the growth of trees because of the minerals and things found in it. And limestone in particular, uh, you may have heard of um, gardeners that sprinkle lime and limestone around their garden beds in order to equalize out to acidic soil. If your plants aren't growing well because the, the pH is too low, you can raise that pH, make it more basic, or at least reduce the acidity of it by sprinkling limestone or lime dust over top of it. 
the limestone, the naturally occurring limestone that is the shelf that Manitoulin Island sits on makes for very, very healthy white cedar. Um, in particular, it kind of infuses the white cedar with more of the resins that make cedar cedar, that make cedar good at its rot resistance. Um, it also makes for very, very healthy growing, which increases the quality, um, increases the grade. There's much less knots. Knots are weakness in the wood. Knots are places that trap water. Knots are places that allow fungus to get hold, allow bugs to get in, things like that um, through, through the, the bark. You have a very fine grain, even grain tree that grows stronger and is therefore going to be more durable to the elements. So it's not that there's anything really different in the technical properties of the wood, it's the grade. A higher grade clear lumber is going to be more durable because it is those defects that are like chinks in the armor, if you will. So because of the soil chemistry and the amount of lime in the soil and the overall pH of the soil due to that geologic formation underneath the island, Manitoulin Island ends up being more durable than mainland white cedar. Now, is it really measurable? Is it that big of a difference? Did you, you know, turn your nose up at, at Atlantic white cedar just in favor of Manitoulin Island white cedar? No, you absolutely shouldn't because it's an island. Yes, it's a huge island, but obviously there's going to be limited resources there. We can't, we can't do that. There's going to be a lot more white cedar on the mainland than there is in Manitoulin Island. But in particular, that does make for, um, particularly good species. So in this case, where he's reclaiming it, good on you, what a find, the color difference is also going to be due to that different soil chemistry. And you'll find, in general, white cedar is called white cedar because it is more of a blonde color. The variety that you're seeing, the reddish brown boards versus the blonde, can be hyper, hyper local soil chemistry issues, where perhaps there was a particular runoff that ran through a pocket of, say, iron. And the drainage to that particular tree, when the water drained down to it, it went through that iron pocket or some um, um, other mineral pocket that increased the amount of minerals in the water being sucked up into that particular tree which then changed the color, increased the number of extractives, possibly raised the tannin level in that particular tree because of what was drained down to it. Now the tree right next to it maybe was catching drainage from a different rivulet that didn't pass, pass through um, for the sake of this conversation, that little iron ore pocket. So it doesn't have that high amount of, of ferrous heavy metals that's being sucked up into the tree and it's not causing the rays and tannins, it's not causing that reddish color. Um, I could be totally making this up. There's a lot of other things that cause more of a reddish color, but iron is, is the most obvious one that causes um, higher tannin levels. So just based on where that tree was located and where it drew its, its, where it draws its sustenance from and kind of what's upstream or up drainage from there could cause a change in that color. And that's like the really cool, fascinating part. And what really creates so much variation in organic nature to trees. If you look at any particular species spread across a wider area, like a deck or a hardwood floor, you're gonna see all kinds of variation from one board to the other. And sometimes it's so um, stark, you think, is that a different species there? But it's all the same species. It's just, you know, rule of, you know, just statistics. You know, if you put a, a thousand planks down on the ground of the same species, you're going to have variation in them. Sometimes you're going to have dramatic variation. Um, uh, tropical species, uh, kumaro, uh, it's used for decking a lot. And there are actually um, people that will sell yellow and red kumaro. It's the exact same species, but some areas it grows redder than others. Some areas it grows more yellow than others. Some areas it grows kind of green in color. And it's such a stark difference that a lot of importers will actually separate it out and sell it as yellow kumaro and red kumaro. There's no difference in species, it's the same one, it just has to do with the soil chemistry in that particular area, which I just find to be so cool. So I wanted to look at a couple of other examples where this shows up and kind of walk you through explaining why it's the case. So let's start really broad a little bit closer to home for me, the Ohio River Valley is known for its hardwoods. It's the place to go 
for a cherry. It's got fantastic walnut. It's got great maple. It's got great red and white oaks. Um, oftentimes, um, it, it, it's, it, there are regionalities, again, based on where you are in the Ohio River Valley. The Ohio River Valley is a really, really large area. But ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's a glacial path that carved out the Ohio River Valley, which left behind all kinds of uh, sediment. Over time, that sediment hardens into strata forming sedimentary rock. And it's the same thing we're talking about with Manitoulin Island, where you may have large instances of uh, particularly good uh, uh, mineral formations that promote the growth of hardwoods or at least temperate hardwood trees. At the same time, you're providing uh, a route for water and you've turned it into a watershed. So everything is flowing towards the Ohio River, draining the Ohio River, providing a, a constant flow of nutrients, or at least one might say, we'll refer to it as the solvent. You know, the water as it runs through the soil is picking up those nutrients and washing it down to the trees. The trees are picking it up through their um, sapwood, bringing all those nutrients in. And that's what's creating just a wonderful lush forest. It's just a perfect um, ecosystem for uh, a temperate hardwood forest. So we have, from a grand scale, the Ohio River Valley. We know it's good for trees. Uh, cherry is one in particular that shows up there. Obviously, the soil pH, the various minerals and things are very, very good for cherry. So let's dial in a little bit closer. Going through the Ohio River Valley, and let's look at one region of the Ohio River Valley, and that's Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania, specifically along the Allegheny Plateau. The Allegheny Plateau, again, is um, you know a glaciated area, and the sedimentary rock, uh, again, is bumped right up against some metamorphic and igneous rock that's found in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it's kind of packed up against it, which has allowed really, really nice growth up against that elevation, that topographic change of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which again, causing drainage down to the Ohio River across particularly um, amenable soil conditions. But what's particularly interesting is um, the timber industry back back in the 1800s, late 1800s, um, the state was heavily timbered um, in that kind of last quarter of the 19th century. Primarily, what industry was looking for was hemlock and pine. These were the dominant species found in those woods. So glaciation left this really, really nice fertile growing plain, but what took over when left to its own devices was hemlock and pine. Faster growing, uh, growing in small clumps, kind of choking out the hardwoods. Um, so the timber industry just logged it. You know, all those terrible images of clear cutting, all the things that, you know, the sins of our fathers we talk about with bad logging practices, that all happened and it left just a wasteland. Well, that caused all those northern woodlands on the Allegheny Plateau, northern Pennsylvania woodlands, they were basically devastated. So really no trees of any commercial value left standing. So then there was floods, fires, mudslides. Um, if you ever uh, look at the Johnstown flood, so much of that was caused by logging from the steel industries, leaving just this, just, you know, <laughs> floodplain. Um, so nobody kind of did anything that land. It was just considered wasted. So nature took over. And because there weren't all of these softwoods competing and choking out the slower growing uh, shade intolerant hardwoods, the uh, hardwoods began to be able to prosper. They didn't have that competition. Cherry particularly is a very opportunistic species. Now it is shade intolerant, but it's got a fantastic seed distribution system, birds primarily. Um, they take the cherry, nice, sweet, yummy cherry, chew the cherry, spit out the pit, and you know they, they seed naturally. So cherry trees, the cherry species found kind of perfect conditions in the Allegheny Plateau. All the soil had been disturbed from all that logging and there was suddenly no competition. So the forest began to grow back and they were all hardwood forests, maple and cherry being the dominant species in that area, especially along that Allegheny Plateau. So here again, the sedimentary rock left by glaciation is particularly nice. The pH and the various minerals and things feed the cherry tree um, quite nicely, as well as 
the maple tree. And there's no coincidence there that both of those trees produce sweet extractives, whether it's the cherry fruit or maple syrup from the maple tree. There's something about that soil from a mineralogical perspective that these sweeter trees absolutely love. So as you really dial down from Ohio River Valley into, you know, think of cherry. And if you were to Google like cherry hardwood or cherry lumber, a lot of times Pennsylvania will be the primary adjective attached to it. The finest cherry is considered Pennsylvania cherry. And that's coming out of this Allegheny Plateau region in Western Pennsylvania. Lumber yards like um, Erie Lumber, Horizon Lumber, that specialize in really, really wide, beautiful, clear cherry boards. It's because it's coming out of that area. And if you go over into Eastern PA or up into New York, you'll see cherry is widespread everywhere. Cherries in Virginia, cherries in Maryland, but it's not the same. The cherries look kind of stunted. They look kind of twisted. The, the lumber coming from those regions has a lot more defects, more knots, and a lot more gum pockets and, and such in them. Whereas the cherry coming out of the Allegheny Plateau is tall and wide and straight grained with zero defects, just absolutely the, the perfect specimen of cherry. And therefore, Pennsylvania cherry is kind of known as the creme de la creme. And that's because of soil chemistry. And it is actually, from a, you know, from a global perspective, it's a very, very small region that's doing that. It's an even a smaller region within a larger floodplain of, not floodplain, drainage plain. Would we call it an estuary? No, I guess we don't. We just call it a river, river valley um, of the Ohio River Valley, which I find, again, very, very fascinating. Um, another example would be walnuts. Um, walnut trees, again, widespread um, when they're able to grow in forests. Again, it's, it's a tree that, that doesn't compete real well, but when it grabs hold and it grows in various forests, a lot of times it can compete um, because of the, just the toxicity. You hear about how walnut shavings, you don't want to put them in a horse barn because it can actually poison the horse. You know, there are lots of humans who are allergic to walnuts and for that matter, nuts in general. Um, the oils and things that come from nut trees like that can often have quite a few toxins in them. Well, walnut is able to take up minerals from the soil that contribute to that toxicity that the walnut tree loves that other trees don't do real well with. So they their competition method, instead of trying to compete in the more fertile soil that the maples and the cherries like, they thrive in a soil that the maples and the cherries don't like. All do, and that's what you know creates those extractives, that level of toxicity that's found in walnut or sometimes in pecan and, and in some well, pecan variants of hickory. Um, it's those toxicities that they like. I shouldn't necessarily call them toxicities. We'll just call them those particular minerals that the other trees don't like. These trees have adapted and found they thrive on them. And the, I think what's interesting is look in nature at like poisonous animals, like tree frogs. You know, the ones that are really, really scary poisonous are like bright, vibrant colors. You know, a jalapeno pepper is, um, it's really, really bright green or sometimes fiery red. You know, that means hot, that means spicy, or that means poisonous. A lot of times nature has a really keen way of saying the stuff that's toxic, the stuff that's, that's spicy, the stuff that can, can hurt you tends to have really vibrant colors. Look at walnut when it's unsteamed. It is red and purple and green, like a, like a bilious green color. Um, all over the place, which again indicates some of that toxicity that makes walnut harmful to animals like horses. That's, that's what walnut thrives on. And it's all about that soil chemistry, which is also why most commercial walnut is steam because the color is all over the place. Air dried walnut, it is crazy from one board to another. And the, the part I mentioned before about the Manitoulin uh, Island white cedar where uh, a couple of boards were red and the rest were blonde, this is really evident in walnut. I think walnut really um, is more of a blank slate. It can take up those extra minerals and it will really take on the character of that extra mineral. So you'll find walnut that's as red as mahogany because again, the drainage went through um, a, a ferrous deposit and it it stained that walnut red. And if you were to actually do some testing on that particular reddish walnut, you'll find a higher tannin content in that wood than something else. 
uh, more cream and gray colors and kind of green colors will be um, indicative of other, sp of other minerals found in the particular soil. And the walnut really takes to these and kind of alters itself based around that. Walnut, again, it, it just, um, it's more of a chameleon, I guess. And you can really tell a lot by the soil chemistry and the pH based upon the walnut you see, assuming it's unsteamed walnut. The steaming obviously is kind of leaching those minerals out, blending those colors together, and, and it doesn't end up looking like that at all, and it won't tell you anything about the soil chemistry. But another particular interesting um, example. Let's go, let's go abroad and look at some exotics here. Um, mahogany, genuine mahogany, Sweetina macrophylla. Sweetina macrophylla grows all across Brazil. It grows across Central America, a lot of South America. Um, it recently has been growing commercially in Fiji. The British, when they still had Fiji, um, as you know, before Fiji became independent, the British started planting genuine mahogany, Sweetina macrophylla, uh, almost 70 years ago now building plantations, recognizing the value, the cash crop that mahogany was on the Fiji Islands. They discovered that the climate, the soil conditions were very much the same. And soil testing shows that where the really good genuine mahogany grows in South and Central America, the soil chemistry in Fiji is, is almost identical. So it was a great place to create a plantation of genuine mahogany. And today there is a large amount of genuine mahogany that is coming from Fiji. Now, remember, genuine mahogany is still CITES Appendix 2 listed, so large amount is a relative term. The global export is still quite low, but one of the places that it's being exported from, despite it being a plantation, is Fiji. But there are external factors, even though the soil chemistry may be similar, it is not identical. And you will be able to tell the difference between a Fiji mahogany and say a Brazilian mahogany. Um, you will find the colors are a little bit different. You'll also find that Fiji mahogany has a lot more pin knots. Now, some of that can be the fact that it's grown in a plantation. It's going to have more sunlight. It's going to, the tree's going to want to branch out more readily, but the soil chemistry and the climate allows the trees, the, the mahogany in Fiji to grow a lot faster not just because they're not forest trees, they're plantation trees, but it just, it's really good. The soil chemistry is really good for mahogany. That Fiji mahogany ends up growing quite a bit faster than the other stuff, so it branches out a lot quicker. Now, appropriate silvicultural management means you're pruning those branches off, you're, you're um, encouraging a long, straight butt section of tree, but you still end up with pin knots throughout every time those branches form. You get a lot of branches forming, you end up with a lot more pin knots. So Fiji mahogany can, can be very easily distinguished by its number of pin knots, and that has to do with, with um, not necessarily adverse soil conditions, but really, really good soil conditions. It didn't naturally grow there for whatever reason. When they planted it there, it became almost invasive. It kind of took over and it grows so super fast that those pin knots now are the, um, the byproduct of that. Looking just within the kind of, quote, natural range of genuine mahogany, we look at Central American mahogany. Uh, specifically, let's look at Guatemalan mahogany and compare that to Brazilian mahogany. You'll find that the Guatemalan is going to be much lighter, pinker in color, lower density, and a lot more kind of rowy grain to it. Look at Brazilian mahogany, and let's let's try to compare apples to apples. Look at Southern Brazilian mahogany, which is going to be similar climate. Um, Northern Brazil being a little bit more mountainous, slower growth. Southern Brazil, a little bit more similar to the growing conditions and climate that you would find in Guatemala. But the Southern Brazilian mahogany is going to be a deeper red. Uh, it's going to have a slightly higher density to it. It's not going to have that kind of variegated rowy grain appearance. It's going to be a little bit more even, more what we would think of as good carving genuine mahogany. That has to do entirely with the soil chemistry. The Guatemala mahogany has a sandier soil. Uh, certainly the water runs through it quickly, but too quickly. And a lot of times the trees kind of grow a little bit sparser. The lower density means that pinker color. The rowy grain means there's inconsistencies. As it rains, um, that, that runoff is flowing very quickly through that sandy soil, and some trees can really soak that up. Other trees may kind of fall, may not get as much of it. Um, the really, really fast, heavy rains, the water may flow through that soil really, really quickly and end up kind of starving the trees, almost creating like a vacuum effect. The water's flowing through the sand so quickly, it's actually kind of sucking water out of the tree as that current goes by. 
Then in times when it slows down, you may take up more grain. So you're getting patches of lower density, pinker grain um, and higher density, heavier grain. And it's kind of intertwined together. And that's what gets that, that rowy look. In Southern Brazil, it's gonna be more consistent. You've got less of a sandy soil, more ground cover, more root structures in the, in the jungles down there. So it kind of evens out the flow and the distribution of water, creating a more even grained, frankly, more desirable mahogany. And to this day, you can buy Guatemalan mahogany, you can buy Brazilian mahogany. Generally, the Brazilian mahogany is of a higher grade. Likewise, go to Northern Brazil or even go up into Bolivia, and now you've got some of the finest grade. Bolivian mahogany is fantastic. It's a deep, deep red color, almost purple. Um, really, really fine grain, like zero defects throughout the wood. Much um, higher density and even harder in wood, but also a more homogenous structure. The stuff carves beautifully because it is so homogenous. It's so predictable under a carving gouge. And that's because Bolivia is a much more mountainous region. You've got slower growing, you have um, a higher rainfall. Um, so you have kind of a continuous supply of nutrients, plus those mountainous regions have a lot more stone, a lot more mineral content. That's what the water's running over them, providing rich mineral runoff to those trees. But because it's mountainous, because it's a little bit cooler, because you've got a little bit more climate seasonal changes, that tree is gonna grow a little bit slower. But because it is still rainforest land, you're not really getting the early and late growth rings that you find in temperate regions. You're just getting kind of consistent, slower growth, making that deep, dark red mahogany with really, really fine grain. Bolivian mahogany, in my opinion, is the finest of the, the modern day junior mahogany just unfortunate that Bolivia, the government of Bolivia kind of thumbed their nose at CITES and now all Bolivian mahogany is illegal. So if you get it, it's probably been in the country for, oh gosh, I want to say that was 2010 that Bolivia, don't quote me on that, but it was, it was recent enough. It was in this millennia that Bolivia, well, I mean, CITES regulation was 2008 on mahogany. So it was shortly after that, that Bolivia kind of said, nah, we don't give a crap. And now all Bolivian mahogany is illegal. Um, we've got some uh, on the yard that was imported well before it was um, CITES listed. I've had some in my shop that I've picked up um, from various sources uh, just over the years that I've been woodworking. It is a definite different wood. And once you've worked it, um, you can kind of always tell Bolivian mahogany going forward. But just that one species throughout its geographic range, you're going to find very distinct differences. Now, this is not like African mahogany. I talk about... Um, how African mahogany is a conglomerate species. It's all sold under the moniker African mahogany, but there are distinct species that come from it. And that is based upon um, regionality, soil chemistry. So in some ways you, you can kind of say it's the same. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, Ivory Coast African mahogany is different from the Senegal African mahogany, which is different from Congo or Republic of Congo mahogany, which is different from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, they're, they're, they are different due to soil chemistry, but they're also, the soil chemistry has produced them to be different enough that they do have different internal structures and are therefore different species. Kaya senegalensis, Kaya intheteca, Kaya grandifolia, Kaya ivorensis, all of those are different species that grow in specific regions. So it's, it's kind of the same, but, a, but different. If you, if you follow what I'm saying there, it, the differences are drastic enough that they merit difference in species. Um, so don't, don't mix those up. But junior mahogany, I think, is a particularly interesting um, case study there. You can also look like more closer to home, um, upstate New York, I said earlier, may not be the best place for cherry, but it's fantastic for maple. Um, upstate New York and Vermont. Well, where does most of the maple syrup come from? Um, I read a statistic the other day, I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's this extremely high percentage of the world's maple syrup comes from Vermont. I want to say it's in like the 90s percent maple syrup comes from Vermont. The soil chemistry in Vermont is particularly conducive to not just maple trees, hard maple trees, but really um, uh, productive maple trees, high syrup producing maple trees that make a very distinct flavor of syrup. And actually you can buy maple syrup from different regions and those that have the palate for maple syrup, the maple syrup connoisseurs will be able to taste the difference. Um, there are some that say they can taste the difference from, you know, Stowe, Vermont and Montpelier, Vermont. I'm making that up, but I guarantee you there's somebody out there that says they can taste the difference. Um, 
in some ways it's kind of like cheese. You know, you go to, uh, over to Great Britain, every town is going to have their, their um, signature cheese. And that cheese is aged in, you know, a basement in a cave somewhere in that town. And it is the bedrock and the various minerals and the moisture that leaches through that bedrock into the cheese aging in that cave that gives that cheese its distinct color. That red Leicester cheese has a distinct color and flavor because of the soil chemistry and the minerals in the ground around Leicestershire. Sorry, maybe I'm hungry, but I went straight from maple syrup to cheese. I'm not sure what that's about. But again, you know, I know I'm a wood nerd, guys, but this is cool. This is really when you start to kind of dissect the various colors and the grain differences and the differences you're seeing in the same species of wood that you bought. You know, the kind of thing that, that you know, as a, as a fine furniture maker, you're going in and trying to find that perfect grain and color match. In other words, you're looking for trees with similar soil chemistry. You know, you're trying to find a tree, maybe boards that came from one tree that had that same kind of soil chemistry uptake. But, you know, you're even going to find different differences within the same tree. And this is when we get external factors operating against the tree that can cause like one board to be one board of cherry to be really, really deep red and another board to be kind of blonder where depending on where it came out of the trunk and what may have happened. Maybe there was a flood that year. Maybe there was a hurricane that year. And there's a couple of really interesting examples of this. Um, bird's eye maple is one of those things that's not quite understood by arborists why bird's eye forms. Um, there's a lot of theories, but no one actually has proven why it happens yet. It's interesting. There's, there's actually more unknowns about trees and how they actually do things than there are knowns. And I kind of love that. In today's modern world, we think we kind of know everything and we don't know much about the actual, you know, technical things and reactions happening in a leaf or within a tree. Bird's eye maple is one of those. It's kind of like, well, we're not quite sure. In others, we can't reproduce it. But we know that in the upper peninsula of Michigan, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of bird's eye maple growing. And there are several factors um, that people are, are hypothesizing around the upper peninsula due to the high tannin content, due to some of the mineral rich soils and the runoff coming from the Great Lakes and the specific... Um, cocktail, if you will, that is found in those massive practical oceans up there that is distinctly different from, say, you know, Lake Winnipesaukee or, you know, a smaller lake or something like that. Lake Superior and Lake Michigan have different um, chemistry to them. So the runoff that's coming from those Great Lakes that is unique in nature because it's the only place in the world you have those Great Lakes, the runoff through the particular unique soil chemistry that already is there due to the bedrock and, and go around like um, Munising, Michigan and the, and the UP uh, on Lake Superior and look at um, picture of rocks uh, landscape there and the sedimentary layers and all the crazy colors that you see in picture of rocks outside of Munising, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's the, all of those crazy colors colors you're seeing is mineral rich deposits um, of sedimentary rock over the years. Those same minerals are leaching into the water in Lake Superior, creating that unique chemical cocktail of the water running off, which is also then running through the bedrock, through the soil itself that's feeding those trees. And something about that, along with the weather conditions, the climate, the snowfall, all that stuff produces a high occurrence of bird's eye maple. And it has to do with that external factor of the Great Lakes being right there. So we know if you're looking for bird's eye maple, contact the folks at Bell Forest up in Ishpeming, Michigan in the UP. They got bird's eye maple. Um, in fact, if you listen to the episode, the interview I did with them, it's kind of where the whole thing started. They started milling up bird's eye maple blanks for pool coom manufacturers and the rest is history. Now they're, I think, the largest online retailer of lumber out there. Um, beetle kill pine or blue stained pine. This was acted upon by a blight um, in the Western United States, up in British Columbia. This beetle came along and it bored holes into the, into the wood and it deposited its eggs, which kind of uh, choked off the nutrients from the tree and it caused the tree to die. At the same time, it created a fungus, which caused this blue stain. That wasn't a soil chemistry thing. It was an external factor in the case, in this case, a bug that has created beetle kill pine. And now beetle kill pine can actually be a couple different species of pine, but it's from a very specific area where that beetle blight happened. Um, interesting again, external factor. Um, one thing I like to look at um, further afield is teak. 
genuine Burmese tea coming out uh, of Myanmar has a very distinct uh, characteristic to it. It's used in the boat building industry because it's practically waterproof because the soil that it grows in in Myanmar is very silica rich. It's got a sandy soil, but there's it's it's not it's not like the sandy soil you might find in Africa around um, uh, uh, African mahogany or even Guatemalan mahogany. It is a sandy sand rich, in other words, SiO2, silica dioxide, rich soil, but it's also dense enough and nutrient dense enough to produce um, the teak tree. But because of all of the nutrients and the uh, adequate rainfall in Myanmar, that silica dioxide, the sand, is being sucked up into the tree and it's essentially infusing the tree with silica, which makes it like practically waterproof. And that's what makes teak the perfect boat building wood. But here's an example. When man tried to act on it, um, from an exterior nature and said, okay, well, you know, we've got genuine teak. We recognize it's just a superior species, but Myanmar, or at the time Burma, was a quite small country. There was some unrest, especially once they gained their independence from Britain. It became military dictatorship after military dictatorship. And even today, essentially genuine teak, while it's not illegal and technically there are no sanctions right now, it is definitely persona non grata for the same reason that Russian lumber is persona non grata because the Myanmar government is doing bad things. So people began transplanting teak, taking Tectona grandis, again, that's the Latin botanical name of teak, planting Tectona grandis in other areas. Can we get plantations going, kind of like they did with Fiji mahogany? Well, the soil chemistry is not quite the same, and you're getting Tectona grandis growing in Africa. You're getting it growing in South America. You're getting it growing in the South Pacific, and it's kind of teak ish looking, but it ends up being a very different species. Many times it's, it's got a lot more knots in it. It's got a lot more color variation. Um, look at a lot of reclaimed teak companies or a lot of companies out there that sell like teak shower mats and teak shower stools or outdoor furniture. And it's all grown from quote plantation or reclaimed teak. Those are grown outside of Myanmar where the soil chemistry is very different. And actually the silica content is not even close to what it is in Myanmar. So those plantation species, while they're useful for you know furniture and stuff, the boat builders won't touch it because it doesn't have the same durability, the same water resistance, because that soil chemistry, that silica dioxide is not there in the same quantities. So it is still Tectona grandis, but it doesn't have the same technical performance because it's grown in a different soil chemistry. And actually, if you put a plantation teak board next to a genuine teak board, even some of the finer plantation examples, um, leaving aside the wider growth rings from a plantation grown, the color is not quite the same. You can definitely see there are some differences in soil chemistry, but within the same species. That's a very common one. Maybe you can't call that an external factor other than plantation. You know, the external factor is man trying to plant it somewhere else. Um, yeah, that happens a lot. Uh, Spanish cedar is another example of this where um, it, it is a South American tree but it has been transplanted to Africa to try to get plantations growing in Africa. The plantation stuff has a lot more pin knots, and a lower resin content from the drier soil in Africa and the totally different pH and certainly greater sunlight due to you know a, a plantation kind of all growing up at the same time without an existing canopy. Um, and the upshot of that is Spanish cedar is often known as cigar wood, uh, humidor wood. Plantation Spanish cedar doesn't have the same extractive content that works well in humidors for controlling humidity and aging cigars nicely. And if you use plantation Spanish cedar in your humidor, while it may work, it's not going to work as well. And many people who make humidors professionally, they will not touch the plantation stuff because it just doesn't work the same, just like the teak. Um, one kind of really cool story, and this is, this is how I'll kind of wrap up the episode, taking this um, regionality and hyper-local soil chemistry and external factors kind of to up and up in the ante a little bit. There are a couple of sawmills in the Pacific Northwest that sell white oak. And the white oak essentially comes with like a warning label saying, warning, this will eat your blades. Um, this stuff is really, really hard. It can actually cause sparking on your blades. You need to use carbide for this. Um, you need to be very cautious of the sawdust because again, it can spark and it can ignite. The reason for that is these were um, trees that were logged from the downwind hillsides of Mount St. Helens, 
when Mount St. Helens erupted in, when was that, 80, 81? Early 80s, I think. I could be totally wrong there. Whatever. When Mount St. Helens erupted very recently, geologically speaking, um, the it's, it's a stratovolcano, um, and all of that ash blew out the side. If you, if you remember, the pressure built up and built up to the point where it actually exploded out the side and it ejected like horizontally and it essentially sandblasted the downwind hills from Mount St. Helens. Well, all of that, you know, volcanic ash was filled with heavy, heavy silicic content uh, igneous rock. So, um, you know, as compared to like magnesium and olivine heavy igneous rock, like you would find in like the Hawaiian islands, the Aa and Pohoihoi um, types of lava that you see, the deep basaltic um, based rocks that, that you find in like the Devil's Causeway up in um, Edinburgh, Scotland. Same type of formations you see in Hawaii with all of that, uh, the obsidian that comes out of it, the basalt that comes out of it. This is totally different. This is um, still volcanic ash, but a lot of the pumice stones and things that, that we can find, um, they, are, uh, they, they are more, a lot more silicic, a lot less magnesium, a lot less um, olivine. What's the one I'm forgetting? Whatever. Um, <laughs> the, the elements that you find in the... In the um, the seabed, in other words, especially around fault lines and subduction zones and things like that. This was a continental stratovolcano. So the minerals and things coming up from the, under the ground were a lot more silicic in nature. And they sandblasted all of those trees and essentially infused those trees with volcanic ash. As the ash continued to fall, it fell on the soil that the tree was then pulling nutrients from the soil up through the sapwoods and into this, as the trees continued to grow for decades after the St. Helens eruption, they were again sandblasting themselves from the inside out, sucking up volcanic ash rich soil. And that nutrients were taken, the waste products were then transported through the medullary rays into the heartwood and infused the heartwood with even more volcanic ash. So when you run one of these white oaks across your saw stop, it's going to trigger that blade instantly because it's got that that conductive material on the inside if you run it across your planer the planer is going to start sparking and it's going to eat your high speed steel blades heck it will actually do some damage to carbide blades but the carbide blades will last a lot longer you will actually see sparks coming off the stuff as you run it across now the upside to this is you have like a waterproof tree it water will actually beat up on these boards it is super super hard um and Basically, you can put it in the ground. It won't, it won't rot at all. But it's a royal pain in the you-know-what to mill. There's a perfect example of an external force acting on the trees, both sandblasting them during the actual eruption, but then also for decades after, um, for lack of a better term, contaminating the soil, which caused the trees to continue to pull up those nutrients and, for, and, and like basically petrify the tree from the inside out. Soil chemistry is fascinating stuff. And you, and you can look at you know one Quercus alba to another Quercus alba from one region to another, from one blast zone to another, and see some amazing things. So you know I guess it's fortunate that there's not a lot of trees where they were like testing atomic bombs out in like the deserts, because um, who knows what those trees would look like. And maybe if we go out to like you know the Bikini Atoll and things like that, well those trees were all vaporized, but maybe. Maybe we'll find some very interesting, um, we'll call them isotope variations of some trees based upon external forces acting upon them. So next time you've got a board of cherry and a board of cherry or a board of white oak and a board of white oak and they're drastically different colored or you've got one board that's got drastically different color from one side of the board to the other, it's the soil chemistry. Take that as an opportunity to learn a little bit about, the ge about geology, maybe learn a little bit about the region from which it came from. And if you really wanna duplicate that color and you can find the providence to find out where that was actually logged and you can go to that sawmill that logged from that region or from that concession, you can probably guarantee a much more consistent uh, color and working properties due to kind of tapping into that hyper-local regionality and soil chemistry of that tree. So that being said, folks, I have yammered on enough and geeked out enough about soil chemistry. Thanks to the folks who sent in questions along this line and allowing me to geek out about it. And uh, go buy some wood 
and then test its pH and find out all about its soil chemistry. See you, everybody.